Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is regularly scheduled meeting of the uh, select board of the town of Sunderland. We'll call to order. Now, I don't re really know what time, because I my my atomic time pieces have different numbers. So, I'm going to call. I'll use the the earlier, which is 6:33. So, Jeff, call to order at 6:33, please. At the present time, Crystal Drake is on on Zoom, so when Crystal votes, she will announce her name and how she votes, yes or no, and that's so that we comply with the, uh, the, uh, the orders that are governing of Zoom or meetings that we are having now. So uh, if anybody wants to be recognized on, on, the, uh, on the Zoom calls, um, you can hit that little hand thing and get up there or raise your hand and we'll notify we'll uh, get you as soon as we can so all set to go first order up is the uh, approval of the minutes of October 4th 2021 at this time I'll entertain a motion motion second, second. we have a motion made and seconded all those in favor please signify by saying aye 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 Crystal Drake, aye. So three zero. Crystal Drake, turn my eye. Like in the old days, we had to talk on a satellite phone. You had to go over. All right. Uh, next up, we have on the new business. We have COVID update. Jeffrey, what do you got? I think we have the chair of the board of health on. Caitlin, are you are you on on? Caitlin, are you there? She just unmuted, so I'm guessing. I think we're having trouble hearing you, Caitlin. I think everybody froze. Caitlin's still oh, muted. There we go. No, they're moving on. Yeah, okay. Um, so while we're figuring that out, um, the state numbers um, for the last reporting period had Sunderland at less than five cases, which um, I think corresponds with uh, what Ms. Rock had mentioned the last time she was here, that the numbers were, were trending downward after that um, late August, early September uh, peak. Um, so I don't know if you had Anything else that you wanted to add, Caitlin? Okay. And I, I think um, the Board of Health is scheduled to meet next Monday, and they're going to be reviewing, reviewing. The, the mask mandate. Okay. So just so everybody knows that, that in the town of Sunderland side, inside the town office building we are we still have a mask um, um, mandate in place and also for uh, inside businesses and that's going to be reviewed next Monday by the Board of Health so we'll have additional comments at that time anybody have any questions about that okay without hearing any um, Caitlin do you want to talk to us now Nope. There she I'm is. I'm sorry, I was having technical difficulties. That's all right. Oh no, you just came up in a you're in a new square. Now oh. you're a center square. Oh boy. Yep. Center square. I couldn't hear you. So okay. Are you you're looking for a an update, right? Yes, ma'am. If you could please, Caitlin. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear anything. I was trying to mess with all my audio and stuff. Okay, um, so currently, uh, over the, since the beginning of October, Sunderland has uh, four cases, um, three females, one male, one is a UMass student. Uh, I have confirmed that our have been vaccinated, one I just don't know. Um, but like I said, I've, I've mentioned before, just because we don't know doesn't mean they're not vaccinated. A lot of times they could be uh, vaccinated out of state. 
um, and not in our system. We don't get the vaccinations necessarily from um, self-reporting. A lot of times you get them in through the state system. So um, that might be just why we don't know. Sometimes we see one vaccination and not the second, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's what we currently have. Um, I, as far as the county uh, statistics, we are low, we're on a lowering trend. We are currently, and I say currently, the number of cases, the two week period that they use is actually September 26th to October 9th. Um, so it, it's a little outdated, but it's what they use so that they know they have completely accurate numbers. Oh, when they say uh, the change in percent positivity, they're actually looking, the change is between September 19th that week and September 26th that week. So when we say lower, it's that comparison. But it's still lower, you know, so we can hold on to that. Um, Franklin County is a 1.5% positivity rate, um, and that's, that's uh, below the state average of 1.82%. The, um, so we're doing better than the state. Um, Hampshire County is at uh, just over half a percent, 0.6%. And, um, and it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, as I say, it's an airborne disease. And we also travel a lot in our counties. Um, and so it's just interesting because we're doing well. Um, Hampshire County is doing well. And then you hit a wall in Hampton County at 3.7%, which is like not quite double the state average, but it's pretty high. Um, and Berkshire uh, County is doing is fairly similar to us, so um, that's about you know where we're at um, in our own area. Worcester is high, like um, much like Hampshire. I mean, excuse me, like Hamden. And I, you know, I think it's a dense population. It's a population that is uh, not as vaccinated. I looked at the vaccination rate and we are trending with the state. We're a little bit higher than the state. I think we're at 70. I'm looking for the piece of paper I had. Um, I want to say 73% uh, in our county. So we're, our vaccination rate is, for our county, is very good. Sunderland itself is looking, I believe, around 73, 74%. I wrote down on a piece of paper and I did not bring it with me to the computer. Um, but we are, you know, we're trending just about even with the state. Uh, our state is doing higher than the other states in the country. Um, the only place doing the best, I would say, is out, uh, out on the Cape, they're 94% vaccinated. <laughs> so if you want to go someplace safe, which is really kind of funny since they have the big outbreaks, but they're at 94%. Um, they're safe now. So that's where we're at. We are slated to discuss the, um, on Monday is our Board of Health meeting. And we are pleased to discuss the mask, man, mask mandate. Sorry, I have <laughs> dinner. <laughs> um, so uh, we're pleased to discuss the mask mandate. And, um, you know, it's that double-edged sword. Um, you know, and I, I haven't made up my mind that I won't. And uh, we, you know, we have love public comment and there's three members of our Board of Health. Are we doing so well because we're masked? Um, I don't know. Deerfield doesn't have a mask mandate, but all the other towns around us do, so I'm just not sure. Um, I, I believe uh, lately, lately I don't believe does. So, you know, um, we're, we're walking that fine.
online and I, you know, do we want to chase it or are we doing okay? You know, um, I'm up for discussion. Um, if we're going to use metrics, our metrics are doing really well. So at this point, I would say, um, you know, I would welcome public comment and discuss it. Hit the end button. <laughs> <laughs> and I would discuss it with my, um, you know, I'm only one third, and I'm very open to discussion. So, so Caitlin, when's your next board of health meeting? Monday. Um, from today. And 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 you have a? Is it a Zoom meeting or is it in person meeting? It's in person. All right. Do you do Zoom also or just in person? I can talk to Cindy Bennett, who is on here, um, but we do, um, I don't know if we have the ability, I, I, we have to talk, but I'm not sure we have the ability to do both like you guys do. Oh, and that's fine. So, so, so we, we do in person, we have it posted, and um, it, will, it will be posted, um, but we'll, um, we welcome public comments. We welcome the public to come. Yep. We always do. So, so I, I guess that's what I would add. If, if someone has a question um, for the Board of Health, do you have an email address, right? For the... Yes. Um, I am... Uh, I am... Uh, I am... Do you know what it is? G-O-H-N-E-R-I-C-E at uh, Tom Sunderland dot, oh, I think it's O-R-G? U-S. 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 Actually, U-S. Don't do O-R-G, you won't get me. Okay, so. B O H B O B-O-H, Board of Health, B-O-H chair at mm -hmm. Town of Sunderland yeah. dot U-S. Dot U-S. So if, if someone has any questions, they can email before Monday's meeting, email yep. the Board of Health at B O H Chair at Town of Sunderland dot US. If you forget that, you, can, if you if you forget that, you can go to the t Town of Sunderland's webpage, search for the Board of Health, and they will have an email address. And if all else fails, you can always send it to the the uh, board of uh, the select board. Uh, email address, and we will get it to uh, Cindy, who will pass it on to Caitlin and the Board of Health. Right, and we, we also get any type of, um, it, well, I get the general, um, Cindy passes on the general emails that come in. Yep, yes she does. Um, right to the, you know, anyone who just emails in with any type of general questions, they always get to me, um, but we have a small, um, kind of a small community so even if just get something town administrator it'll get to me and uh, it'll get to our meeting don't worry and it will be addressed thank we you promise thank We're you caitlin. for the town okay thank you caitlin anything else yep um, i don't think so cindy was there anything else that we we're going to address tonight no <laughs> I rely on Cindy. By oh. way. All right. Thank you. Thank you for stopping Thank by tonight, guys. Caitlin. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next up, under new business, we have received a letter from a group entitled Gracious Greens. And Gracious, Gre Gracious Green would like to meet with the, uh, the board, an introductory meeting with the board and they are a potential retail marijuana facility. So do we have members from Gracious Greens? Hi, Mr. Chairman, Peter D'Agostino with 10X Strategies. Okay. If I uh, could introduce uh, the team, if, if I may. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, for meeting with us tonight. Uh, hopefully, you've had a moment to review our introductory letter. 
Uh, joining me are Chris and Steven from Gracious Greens. They could wave. <laughs> uh, so we're representing them uh, along with myself is my team, Victoria Ireton and Jacob Hicks. So I think we've taken up half your meeting, so I apologize. But uh, we got the whole team here. So oh, that's, really that's fine. I'm really the opportunity to come to Sunderland. Um, Chris and Steven uh, had uh, sent in the letter to the board just for the opportunity to meet with you tonight uh, to discuss with the board the potential of doing a community outreach meeting so we could gauge the interest of the residents uh, and our abutters, certainly, as it relates to this project, uh, and then potentially even um, beginning to discuss uh, what host community agreement language might look like. We understand the town um, has some draft language from another town that they're considering. So the reason that we would maybe make those first couple of steps would be so the public would have the ability to give us some direct feedback on our proposal uh, and the location and the project, get an opportunity to meet Chris and Stephen, who are the owners, um, as well as understand what the host community agreement might look like for the for the town and, and how that impacts the community. Okay. Uh, so that was the purpose of tonight's meeting. Can can. Uh can you state the ad address for everyone, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's yep. uh, 267 Amherst Road, Suite 2. Did you get, you got that? Yeah, I think I froze up there for a second. You did, but that's, that's fine. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> yes, 267 Amherst Road. So we're in Suite 2 of that uh, property. Uh, the landlord also had submitted a letter to the board uh, expressing his support of, of going into that uh, location. Okay, so so just so everybody knows, so I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're talking to address. So if anybody's, uh, it make sure everybody's got the same location. It's 267 Amherst Road. So that if anybody has any questions at the location and there there's a, a multiple suites in that building and you're looking at suite number two and it'd be a 2000 2000 square 2000 square foot facility correct correct yeah excellent. That's all correct. excellent okay all right sorry to interrupt i just want to get want to make sure everybody gets the same information yeah no that's great i, I appreciate bringing that up so um, at, this, at this point, Mr. Chairman, we'd like to open it up to the board for any questions. We have a full team here. Uh, just by way of background, our, our companies work with a lot of municipalities across the state. Um, we are located right in Boston, um, and we've had a great uh, relationship with a lot of communities in working through these projects and working with the residents and neighbors. Um, Chris and Stephen are both, uh, this is their first adventure into cannabis here in, in Massachusetts. But I'll just sure note in the letter, they both have fairly extensive backgrounds in, in new businesses and adult use products and things like that. So uh, certainly appropriate backgrounds for this type of business. Um, so with that, Mr. Chairman, we'll open it up to the board for any questions. Um, we'll do our best to answer anything we can. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, if the board is so inclined, we'd, we'd like to get permission to do a virtual community outreach meeting to meet with our the abutters and our neighbors and, and get some feedback just as the next step. Thank you. Dave, you want to start? Any questions? I'm oh, just looking through our list of... Um, <clears throat> Crystal, do you, do you have any questions to start? All right, so 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 part to review is that by our town bylaws, a cannabis shop has to be uh, located in our C1 commercial district, which you are, right? The other thing is that you have to be greater than 500 feet from religious and or schools. schools yep. 
and you make that also? Yes, sir. Correct. Okay. So, so I guess one question I would ask is that we we've been there was just a report the other day I saw is that uh, uh, retail cannabis is now offered into a uh, hundred I think over a hundred communities in the state of Massachusetts right now. You can't hear us. Oh. Jeff, will, Jeff will fix. It's, I think it, it boots us off at regular intervals. We have fixed that, Jeffrey. It doesn't make any sense. I've tried calling. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID. Should just put that in the speed dial. <laughs> Enter your participant ID. You are in the meeting now. There are 13 participants in the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Crystal, can you hear us again? We can hear you again. That's good. It cut out right when you very first started talking, Tommy. Of course. Oh my God! I, I'll have to recreate that that statement that I made. It was it was amazing. It was great. Yeah. Oh. I thought it was great. I jeez. All right. So 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 basically, there there's there was just a report the other day that cannabis distribution now within a, like a hundred communities in the state of Massachusetts. I, I noticed late lo locally that that we've. Um, we're looking at other facilities that are coming up next to us. Why do you think you guys will be successful in Sunderland? So um, that's a great question, actually. So uh, you know, when you look at cannabis statewide, um, you know, we have 351 cities and towns. We have about 180 bands. So you know, call it roughly 50-50. Split. So even when you say, oh, there's there's one in this town and there's one in that town, the reality of it is is there's only about half of the municipalities that even have cannabis. And then when you further analyze that, the limitation that many communities have, and, and under the state law, what it does is it says the community can limit the number of cannabis establishments to 20% of their liquor stores, which many communities have. So when you do the math, we are talking about half of the communities in the state with only 20% of the liquor stores in the half of the community. So when you say, oh, there's 100, there's about 150 retail stores currently um, made <coughs> statewide with the majority of them being uh, 495 and east. Um, if, if you think adult use products, generally speaking, um, would see similar traffic to a liquor store, then cannabis stores, even if fully built out, would only represent 20% of the amount of liquor stores in half of the community. So my point saying that is the opportunity, even in a smaller town like Sunderland, are still fairly good. Um, also, you're near 91, which is you know not lost on us. Um, that and Chris and Stephen also were very focused on their first venture being something very manageable, something they could execute well, that they could manage and not go into a 10,000 square foot uh, retail store in downtown Boston that costs millions of dollars. So this, I think, is two things. One, I think cannabis generally is a good opportunity in, in any community that welcomes it because of those opportunities, uh, because of those limitations that are out there. And then two, Sunderland specifically was a good opportunity for Chris and Steven because they were very focused on specifically doing something just like this. You know, a smaller community, uh, a smaller store, really making it nice, doing something craft, doing something that, uh, you know, that local folks would be attracted to. So it, it aligns very closely with their goals as well as uh, the overall still being an opportunity, kind of no matter where you go. Those two reasons, I think, why, yeah. that's why cannabis is an opportunity and why Sunderland was a good fit for Chris and Steven. How, how do you, do you, do you, do you foresee any problems with, with access to the store, getting in and out of the, because uh, there, there's a lot of other, I would say, high traffic businesses in that area. 
And would do you see that as a potential problem? And how would how would you mitigate and how would you mitigate those traffic concerns? Uh, that's a great question. I just want to confirm. Do you mean folks actually being able to get into the store physically, or do you mean uh, from a traffic flow perspective? I, I'm I well, you know that actually that's it's a two part that's a two part question because and again just just from seeing some of the the things in surrounding communities, um, it that. I mean, we do have a. I mean, there is a traffic light there on one in, entrance, but but I would say how how do how do we maintain traffic and and customer access to the other buildings at the same time? Right. Um, I suspect when you say uh, when we think other neighborhoods, you may be talking about Leicester um, and kind of what they experienced when they first opened because uh, they're maybe the closest. Community that experienced quite a bit of traffic, um, and when Lester opened, um, although not necessarily close to you, uh, that's just the closest one. Uh, when Lester opened, it was one of two stores uh, in the entire Eastern Seaboard uh, that had opened uh, at that time. There's only two in the entire East Coast, so they did have ample traffic and things like that. But that was uh, they were two of two. Uh, they opened on the same day, and, and that was quite a while ago. So. There's also, so a couple of things. One, since that time, uh, 150 stores have opened statewide, roughly. And so that has started to spread out the demand and, and people can shop closer to home, if you will. Uh, and then maybe even more significantly, when we think about traffic impacts and the movement of people in and out of the business, both meaning they're getting to the site with their car and then physically getting in and out of the store. One, as, as you folks know, probably better than I do, there is pretty ample parking at this location, so, so that's certainly a benefit to getting folks in and out of the store. But maybe more significantly, maybe more impactful was when uh, the pandemic hit, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but the governor actually closed adult use marijuana stores um, in an order to um, prevent any crowding and, and you know to allow for social distancing. When they opened the stores back up, one of the things the Canvas Control Commission did, well, they did a lot of things, um, and some of which have what I'll call held over, you know, which will be here post-pandemic, and that is specifically a strong adoption of third-party software for ordering. So uh, consumers now go onto an app, um, they can order, they can see the menu for that day, they can order their products from that store, they can pre-place their order, uh, and then the store prepares that order, and then somebody can come there and pick it up, much like any other retail business, how they operate. The big difference is we probably jumped, uh, you know, most industry folks will tell you that that technology moved about 10 years in about a 60-day period. So primarily before we were seeing about 95% of the customers would come into the store and decide what they were shopping for once they got there. And during that time, meaning pre-pandemic, from a traffic engineering perspective, we would use about 15 minutes per customer for calculating how long they were gonna be in the store. Traffic engineers, of which I am not one, uh, but traffic engineers now are using five to seven minutes uh, trip times because what we're finding is about 80% of customers are using the um, app that's and again the CCC regulates all this these aren't like fly-by-night operations here but um, they do regulate third-party software vendors under the current regulations which again are, are new uh, since the pandemic the CCC passed those regulations in January this year um, and they regulate those third-party apps. And we're seeing kind of statewide about 80% of customers using that. So they literally pull into the parking lot, they go into the store, their ID is checked before they enter the store. They go to the counter, they say who they are, their ID is checked for a second time, all that of course with the regulations. There are, uh, the, the person cashing them out will get their order, cash them out, and they go along their way. So we are just not seeing weights outside of buildings like you saw a long time ago, or traffic issues like you saw a long time ago. The technology and the advancements made really mostly in response to the pandemic have really moved the industry along. And so communities need to start seeing those impacts um, anymore. 
Uh, and so we suspect, given there's a traffic light, given there's ample parking, and given kind of the direction that the industry moved last year uh, in response to the pandemic, that it would be unlikely that we would have any traffic issues at, at this site. So, so the one one thing I'll add, okay, we we uh we appreciate that that your you know the town looks at you know businesses is good for our, is good for our town. I I can I can let you know that that area has been a concern um, both with us and the state because of accidents that have happened in that area. It's, it's probably our highest accident rate in town. And we, we've also had a couple fatalities there also. So that, um, and, and we've tried to uh, do what we can in that area to make it as safe as possible. We always think there's addition. So, so I think, you know, when we sit down and start, you know, start the conversation, one of our, the things that we would want to talk to you about is trying to ensure that that area is as safe as possible. And, and I, I don't, and, and I agree with you. Yeah, I apologize, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. I, I agree with you. I'm not a traffic engineer, um, but I, I know we talk to a lot of them in our business, and some of them I think are right on and spot on, and some of them I have no idea what they're seeing. But, but at that being said, I, we, we would like to work with you, but one of, one of the things that we will talk to you about, and, and, and David and Crystal, if if you want to add also but I, I we would be concerned about the traffic and and I think you'll find that you know in the morning and at afternoon the traffic coming from um, UMass going into UMass in the morning and from UMass at night can be very heavy so and and also the nighttime now we're starting to get in fall the winter time it gets dark in that section and and we have concerns so we'd be we will be very happy to talk to you and Mass, have, Mass Highway if possible. We'll bring them all in so we can try to make that as safe as possible. So we, A, you guys can do a great business there, and also we keep everybody safe that use that road through there. Yeah, so certainly, our, you know, certainly a concern of ours is to make sure, you know, not just our customers, but the residents and the community are safe. Um, we would absolutely anticipate and expect to do um, you know, traffic impact statement and traffic analysis as, as part of our special permit, which is a process we'll still have to go through with the town. Um, you know, as you, you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this is very preliminary step in, you know, hearing not only that feedback from you, but uh, if you so allowed us to go and do a community outreach meeting and learn about even some more, uh, let's say, neighborhood specific uh, things that we, we may not know sitting here tonight that the neighbors will educate us about and other thoughts that they have. So so that's really the whole purpose of this process and, and why the town, I assume, put it in place is to facilitate these public discussions first with the board and, and next with the neighbors. And that will inform kind of how we all collectively move forward, I would suspect. Uh, there may be things we have to consider as part of the whole community agreement. There may be things we have to consider specifically as it relates to our special permit application to the town. Um, and, and all of that would be not only the comments here tonight, but, but uh, you know, most significantly what, what our neighbors and, and our mothers um, have for thoughts. So, so that would certainly be our approach, just to maybe put that up front that we would expect to get that information and include all of that as part of our submittal to the town. Okay. So, so Crystal, you got a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, do you have um, information like um, in the area, number of people with, or percentage with um, medical marijuana? I, I, I don't, I appreciate the question. I'm not sure how many licenses are in, you know, this general area. Um, I, I will tell you, I think the state is sitting somewhere around 48,000 licenses for uh, medical marijuana cards for the whole state. But, but just so I don't confuse uh, anybody that might be watching from home, this would be for an adult use application. Um, so the amount of medical patients in this area wouldn't necessarily translate into how many customers we have. Okay. So. Oh, no, I realize that. I'm just you know, curious what that population that we would be limiting. So like 
the big, well, I know you said Lester, but the biggest one that we saw in this area was Netta, right yeah. Hampton, when that went in, and it was just, you know, people standing outside for three, four hours to get in there. I know it's not like that. We drive, you know, every day drive by them, and we don't see those type of crowds. I'm just wondering, you know, are we going to be cutting down on people having to travel to get medical? You know, do we have enough of a demand in our area that there's actually a benefit to the city for not having to travel to purchase the people with medical? Well, we, we certainly think so, which is why we, you know, think Sunderland is a, a good fit. Um, one thing I will tell you, and, and you're right to your point, ma'am, uh, Netta in Northampton opened the same day as Leicester, and they were the first two in the entire eastern seaboard, so God bless them. Uh, but certainly some growing pains there for both communities. Um, and you're right, I, I had forgotten that Northampton was actually closer. but. Um, as it relates to your further question related to medical, so we certainly think there is an opportunity here in Sunderland to, to have a good business. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll offer is that the state or their medical marijuana program maintains a database. And under the state regulations, it says that that database is available for law enforcement should they choose to use it. Uh, and so many people who do have a medical need for cannabis do not get a medical card uh, because they're then put into a publicly available database. Uh, and there is some question as to whether HIPAA protections apply to medical marijuana cards because it's federally illegal, uh, but yet it still somebody's medical information. And that has been an unresolved point of contention for some time. And so what I would offer is that, well, the medical patients are certainly a community we hope to serve, uh, the reality of it is many, many people who use cannabis medicinally do not go and get a card uh, for those purposes because they're not sure that that medical information would be protected. It's, it's not clear where the law sits on that yet, which is why when we look at, you know, four and a half, or six and a half million residents in Massachusetts, only about 48,000 have a medical card. But yet the industry is done as of today, so in uh, just under 10 months, uh, the adult use industry has done uh, just over a billion dollars in sales this year, uh, and the medical marijuana program has done about 200 million. So the adult use market is about five times that in the state for 2021, and then year to, uh, and then since in the last three years, so the CCC will celebrate three years of adult use sales next month. The uh, state has also already crossed 2.1 billion. Um, and you know, obviously, with a couple of months of data still to go, so it's very likely the state will hit two to two point three billion uh, over that three-year period. So, lots of folks out there, many of which don't have medical cards but use it medicinally uh, for the reasons I mentioned. David, any questions? Uh, one of my questions just got answered. So, okay, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, I, I have one question. Um, for for those like myself that may not be f familiar with how 267 Amherst Road is situated, is where is Suite 2? If you're standing on 116 looking in the building, is it right, left, front, back? Victoria, do you want to just take us a little bit through um, how that's situated? Victoria, I think has been doing a lot of work on this and, and has been speaking to the folks in town uh, what much more well-versed on on the actual layout, she's been working with the uh, realtor and the owner, so I'll let her speak to that if I may. Yes, uh, so this would be to the left of the parcel. If you're standing on the street and looking at the building, it's to the left side at the far end. So you're actually at the end of the unit, um, right on that corner of the building. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah, I think there was a unit that's, that's around the back, and I just wasn't sure if that was this, the unit you guys were looking at or not. Um, and maybe it's maybe we should. The, the I was gonna say maybe, maybe we should give folks a description, not just the street address, because a lot of people might not know. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, the that's the building with the yoga center. Yoga, yeah, and, right. Um, <clears throat> like just before the where the dove's nest and everything else right. is. Right. Um, well, before or after, depending on what direction. Yeah, that's true. Going. Depending on which direction you're going, yeah. Um, so I think the other thing that I just wanted to 
emphasize, and this isn't really a question, but more for, for people who might be listening in or watching later, is that this is really the first step, the first introduction to, to let the community know that there is a business, a cannabis business interested, um, giving some preliminary information, getting a sure. chance to, to meet the business. Um, you know, Mr. D'Agostino mentioned the community outreach meeting. That would be, uh, you know, direct invitations to a butters per the regulations. It would be an open meeting if anybody's interested. The town would certainly um, make that information available on the website and uh, get that information out to people. Um, and I think that's the the best opportunity for for the public to engage in questions, get their questions answered if they have particular concerns. Um, that that's really the the opportunity there and then um i think one of the things that that we were going to do tonight is um have the the select board decide who they want to be in the negotiations for the host community agreement which would start after the community outreach meeting i think that part of the purpose of the community outreach meeting is if you know we have 3,600 people in town and if 3,600 people show up to your remote meeting and all say we don't want it, then, <laughs> then you know, that's a pretty clear, strong message. I don't think that's going to happen, but um, that would follow the community outreach meeting so that we could also hear what the community is saying um, and then, you know, look at incorporating some of those things into the host community agreement. So I just wanted to give that overview. Um, so I see there's a hand up from Pat. Pat, no? Yes, hi, good evening. Um, I'm actually the broker of record for this building. So I wanted to um, just uh, respond a little bit more in detail about the other occupants so you can get an idea. Um, as Victoria stated, this particular suite would be the southern half of the first floor. The other half of that level to the northern end is occupied by the Visiting Nurses Association is their office. And there is a single room on that side of the first floor that's occupied by a local surveyor, just his office away from home. The lower level of the building, which is a walkout in the back, the southern half of that level, which would be directly under this retail uh, facility, is occupied by the meditation center they own their unit this building is actually comprised of two commercial condominiums so the meditators have been there since the very beginning in the 80s uh, the other half of the lower level walkout in the back is uh, occupied by the care collaborative and they are a um, educational group that trains uh, medical uh, folks, uh, like CNAs, um, folks of that uh, profession. Um, so actually between <laughs> between the care collaborators downstairs and the, uh, the visiting nurses upstairs, it's kind of a, uh, that's kind of the orientation of the building. Um, but the, the yoga center is no longer in existence downstairs. Um, I'll also note for you that there are 70 on parking, uh, on-site parking spaces. Well, thank you, Pat. That's good information. Yeah. If you have any other specific questions about the building, I will try to field that. But you can get, I think that would, you know, a little additional information. So, so uh, back, back to questions on, on the facility and, and the process. So basically, we need to uh, um, work out a host agreement. And then you guys go to the CCC for a license, and and I, I'd ask that because we're we're all pretty familiar with how our local liquor license are are awarded. Um, so we kind of do all the work in the town, then then we send it, and it goes off to Boston, and they decree that it, it's accepted or not. So how how would it work for you guys? Yeah, a little, a little bit different on uh, the campus side. So we would do the community outreach um, in the way that the member just uh, outlined, which is, which is exactly correct. I, I will add that in addition to noticing the town and the, the, the direct mailing to the butters, we also will run an ad in the paper like, like any other 
uh, legal notice. So for, for folks that don't live nearby or don't visit the town website, that data would still be available to them. Um, one, so the community outreach meeting is the process required by uh, the, the state, certainly by the town, and, and it's an important process to all of us so we can uh, understand exactly what the residents are thinking and, and find ways to address that. So that's the first step. Um, typically what would run in parallel would be getting a host community agreement put together and uh, we wouldn't finalize that until after the community outreach meeting because of course we want to get that feedback from the neighbors and the residents to see one, is this the right fit for the town at this location? And if generally people were agreeable to it, there may still be things that we would want to address in the HCA. So, so there's really a couple of reasons for, for that community engagement, all of which are important. Uh, then we would do the host community agreement. At that point, Is that us again? It must be. Yeah, no, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> and you notice the intervals get short. John, John you're going to fix this. Welcome to Zoom. Uh, it's Zoom. I have no idea. Do we have highlight video at the end of the year? And just having you guys keep going back and forth and pushing in the code? Yeah. yeah. Enter your participant. So you can fix it. Are in the meeting now. There well, are it's, a, it's a Zoom. I know that I do the does the this same thing with the phone, but they don't have this problem. Maybe it's something with your account settings. Yeah, I think it's it's Zoom. It's not like a. FK. Okay, you can go back. We're we're back. We we're, we're, we have to go check our Zoom account setting someday. Yeah. So uh, we're back talking. Can you hear us now? I, I can't, Mr. Chairman. I just, uh, so we stopped. We stopped at the CCC. Okay. So uh, the community outreach meeting, the host community agreement, would be the two local elements required for us to apply to the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, so we would take those two processes uh, and we would include them as part of my, our application to the state. The application would then go through the process of background checks, so on and so forth, and eventually, at some point the Cannabis Control Commission would deem the application complete and they would go back to the town and say this is a notice that somebody supplied for your community did you know that and uh, are they compliant with your zoning have they met the requirements of your zoning so are they in the right district do they have the right buffers in accordance with what you as a town require which we kind of already determined is true but but the town would have one more bite at the apple, so to speak, to confirm that that data is, is, is correct. Um, and if the town so signed off on it, we would then go before the commission and they would vote on the provisional license. And, and I hate to say it, but that's really just the first step in licensing. We would then, you know, while all that was happening, we would still be going through our special permit process, which is, again, is more public hearings and opportunities for the public to, to comment. Um, we would be going through the construction phase of any build out, you know, after getting the special permit. So there's, there's quite a few steps. There's a lot of opportunity for the public to weigh in along the way. Um, and kind of when all of that is done, uh, we would go back to the state and ask for a final license where they would come out and do an inspection. If everything got signed off, then they would give us a final license. And believe it or not, there's a third final inspection by the state uh, that would be done just uh, a few days before we open. So, and, and also keep in mind that the town would have to do a certificate of occupancy and things like that. So, so the, the processes uh, mirror each other for the most part. They they run in parallel for the most part, um, and it's us working really with both the state and the town at the same time to to make sure we're getting all that stuff done. So, it's a very public process, quite frankly. Um, and what we'd be working a lot with this board and with the planning board on. Okay. Jeffrey, any questions that you had? No. David? No. I'm good for now. Crystal? Crystal, we can't hear you. We can. Now we can. Now we can. Uh, because I was sitting backwards. Or back too far. Yeah. Are you all set? I'm good, thank you. 
Uh, anybody else have any comments? Looks like Mom? Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Peter's lower half has one. You, uh, there you go. Hey. Um, <laughs> Nito took a dinner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just had a general question. I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Dino for a very clear uh, way of explaining things. Uh, uh, that was nice to hear. I was wondering if you could speak to uh, your experience with the financial either benefits or benefits and costs that the town like ours might be uh, facing uh, if we go ahead with this. Yep. So uh, that's a great question. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you asking it. Um, First and foremost, there, there's really two um, financial revenue streams, if you will, for, for the town. First, first and foremost, the town voted to accept the taxation of cannabis, which I strongly suspect that you have. Um, there would be a 3% excise tax on any transaction that we uh, conduct at the store. And it's paid in the exact same way any other state tax would be paid. DOR collects those funds and that the 3% the local excise tax. And then that, um, those dollars are reimbursed to the town dollar for dollar. So the state doesn't take any part of that 3%. Um, and that's just like any other regular tax, similar to cigarettes or something along that way. So that's, that's one avenue by which the town would uh, receive revenue. And then to your other question about uh, potential costs related to this, that is addressed in the host community agreement specifically through what they call the community impact fee. So Mass General Law Chapter 94G Section 3D allows for the town to charge a community impact fee of up to 3% of our gross sales, which is separate and in addition to the taxation. And that 3% is specifically um, cited in the law for offsetting any cost to make the town may have. So for example, you're going to have to spend some money on the attorney to draft up the HCA and review it and things like that. So uh, assuming we come to an agreement and this business opens and so on and so forth, the town um, would receive those funds through the community impact fee and the idea is that they would offset all of your costs. Uh, the general approach in many communities is that the town is receiving funds in excess of their costs, um, and so so much so that in Northampton, uh, I think they have about a two million dollar reserve in excess of their costs, and uh, they stopped collecting the, the community impact fees uh, because they had such a reserve. Um, so the town is fairly well protected financially, both through a revenue uh, generation of tax taxation and through the community impact fee to protect against any costs the town may have incurred, whether it be legal expenses or other things. For the basic uh, 3% fee, the first one you talked about, are there, are there restrictions on the way that can be used? Uh, there are not. That's right. It's just an excise tax. So we pay it to that DOR just like we do our regular sales tax, if you will, uh, and then the town gets uh, dollar for dollar 3% reimbursement. So it goes off the DOR. It comes back down to the town that goes to the general farm. So, and in, your, so. in your experience with the various places that you work that uh, towns or cities generally also uh, put into place the second fee that you talked about? Everyone that I'm aware of. Okay. So, so, so yeah. Peter, on, yeah. on, on the uh, CMR, it's the Master General Law 935 CMR 500 if you have free time and you got the law books that you can go online to fee. But basically what it says for that, the fee, that 3% fee, that it says, and this is a policy that we, our town runs, the town shall use the above reference payments in its sole discretion, but shall make a good faith effort to allocate said payments for road and other infrastructure systems, law enforcement, fire protection service, inspectional services, public health, and addiction services and permitting administrative and consulting services as well as unforeseen impacts upon the town so it 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 doesn't say you have to do a certain thing but it kind of kind of lays out where you should spend that money no, well thank you for the answers i just think that that's you know that needs to be part of the, the whole examination part i assume it would be at some point anyway and 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 basically also peter that that original agreement is uh, is is good for up to a period of three years, and then 
um, or in any time up to that, you can renegotiate if, uh, if like the city of Northampton has two million dollars in reserves, it, you can you can waive that fee or, or make that fee. But yeah, that's part it's part of the uh, the policies that we that we work with here also. Okay, thanks, Tom. You're welcome, Peter. Okay. Any other questions? I do. I guess, Mr. Chairman, just, just for us, we, we would just need some authorization. The CCC required that we uh, get the approval from this board to conduct the virtual community outreach meeting specifically. Uh, the board so inclined to allow us to do that. And then additionally, if, if uh, we could begin working on the host community agreement, uh, we can certainly get a draft put together if there's a member of the board that uh, is going to be a point of contact or if you want to work with the town administrator or whatever is appropriate for you. Um, but the former, the virtual community outreach meeting, it, uh, we would affirmatively need your permission to go do that under uh, the uh, admin order number two issued by the Kansas Control Commission. So what, what, what we can do is uh, uh, we can, we can, I'll entertain a motion in a second to, uh, to allow the, uh, the, the virtual hearing. Um, but as far as the, uh, the appointment of our member to the uh, HCA, the, the, the uh, agreement, what I'd like to do is uh, allow David and Crystal an opportunity to think about it um, and discuss that with the uh, town administrator and we'll make that appointment next uh, Monday night's our next meeting. And we'll make, if that's okay, we'll make that meeting. We'll make that uh, determination when I think Crystal will be back. We'll be back, Crystal. Uh, yeah, I'll be back Wednesday. Okay, and we'll it will talk. We can talk about that uh, Monday night, and we'll make a determination. Um, so at this time, um, are there any other questions from David or Crystal? All right, now. At this time, I'll entertain a motion. I'll entertain a motion to uh, allow Gracious Greens to. Uh, um, continue with their uh, uh, community meeting, which will be scheduled in the in the. Uh, we'll do it in comport, you know, conformance with the uh, state open meeting law. So, did notice, you know, get a certain amount of time for notice or public hearing. They, I think you have to publish it in the paper seven days in advance. Is that right for this, or is it? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So we will comply with. 935 uh, for the purposes of the motion it would be in accordance with 935 cmr 500 as well as the Kansas control commission administrative order number two those are the two requirements we have to comply with um, from a notice perspective that means we have to put it in a newspaper 14 days prior to the meeting we have to send a butters within 300 feet a letter seven days prior to the meeting and we also must formally, even though you're giving us permission to do it, we then have to formally notice the town also seven days prior to the meeting. All of those requirements oh are contained under administrative order number two as issued by the Kansas Control Commission. So we would comply with all of those, which actually far exceed open meeting law requirements. So just to not cut the public short, we, we would uh, comply with the higher bar, which would be those. So, so, question to you, do, do we, virtual is okay? During a pandemic, I think that it's, it's a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Dave, do you have a problem? I, I mean. Yeah, I think that's fine. You okay? Yeah, that's fine doing that one. Crystal, you okay with virtual? I'm fine with virtual as long as we're, you know, going to have a, a time frame that's, you know, reasonable. Good for most people, not, you know, during the middle of a work day or something like that. Where right. So okay. Sure, if I could address that. So the administrative order number two that I'm referencing also requires us to conduct the meeting outside of business hours. Okay. We typically do it at 6 p.m. has become kind of a standard for the CCC, but we could certainly entertain other times. So the administrative order does require us to do it outside of business hours. We typically do it at 6 p.m. 
It also requires two other things. It requires us to publish the meeting materials not less than 24 hours prior to the meeting. It also requires us to provide in the 14-day notice an email address by which people can submit questions prior to the meeting. So this is absolutely intended to um, provide for public input. That is really the reason we're doing it. And also, there's something in that uh, CMR that says that if the Red Sox are in the World Series, yeah. you can't you can't schedule for the meeting for that day, right? Well, I appreciate the sentiment. Let's hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I know there's a couple guys from New York there. That's why I kind of wanted to say that. Uh, you know. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, you said that. You said. Uh, we didn't do so well this year. Yeah. You said tri it says tri-state area, so I got to say, well, are they? East or west of Hartford, because that's what you kind of a. But if there's Long Island, my Long Island, there are a lot of Red Sox fans on Long Island. So, all right. We'd be more comfortable with Long Island. Yeah. Okay. I know. Fans. All right. So, uh, so at this I, time, I just got a yeah. question. For yeah, I, I, I would just suggest for for everybody's comfort level, as we're scheduling it, we work together, just because. I know the meetings that are happening in town and to avoid conflicts, things like that. Um, uh, just a, a suggestion as we're picking a date and time. I'll, uh, I I'll absolutely make will coordinate uh, with you, uh, absolutely. And, Why is that um, yellow? You know, further, not only will we consider your schedule, we, we actually also have to consider the publication schedule of the newspaper. So there's a lot that goes into the date. Uh, it, it, I, I say this That's often, right, don't worry the about date it. kind of picks itself when we line up all the requirements. Although so I sent them else. We will yeah. work with the town to finalize the date uh, prior to any kind of notice. So no problem at all. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll make the motion. All right, so at this, this time I'll, I'll entertain a motion um, that will allow Gracious, Gracious Greens a um, opportunity to hold a community outreach meeting in conformance with the uh, rules and regulations of the uh, applicable CMR, which is 935, 935 CMR 500. We'll have a motion. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? All right, we have a motion made, a motion seconded by Crystal. All those in favor of the motion to allow the uh, community outreach meeting Scheduled through the uh, town administrator to coordinate dates. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Crystal Drake, John Pine. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to get it right. That, right? Was, that was impressive. Uh, all right. Yeah. All right. So we have a three zero. Um, it looks like we're going to move this forward. So we uh, Thank look forward. We appreciate it. We'll, we'll look forward to a member getting appointed next week, and we will uh, be in touch with the town administrator tomorrow to start working on a date for the meeting. Excellent. We'll talk, talk to you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you you also. Appreciate Thank it, everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know the one the one thing about the uh, the computers is it does. You can follow. It's a lot easier than the papers, I yes, think. It's easy to flip around. Okay, Gracious Green. We will be closing you up. Back to the agenda. All right. Select board updates. Crystal? Uh, did I not? Is that not the updated? There's an updated agenda. Oh, with the uh, Riverside Park Improvement that. Contract, right? Okay, we'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to it. Um, Crystal, any updates? I have no updates. David? Uh, we had a fabulous uh, Frontier Building Committee subcommittee meeting, and then we have one more coming up in January. Um, and I believe Frontier Union 38 negotiations will be starting shortly, so... Good. Um, the uh, s update from the South County Senior Center is that um, we have a number of applicants for the director's position. Um, we have some volunteers that would uh, like to work on the search committee. 
Um, hopefully they're going to um, start soon. Jeff? They've started. Okay. And what, what the uh, search committee will do is um, forward their recommendations to the Board of Oversight, and the Board of Oversight will then meet with the applicants, correct? With the uh, town administrators? Yes, and I think the Deerfield Select Board is the hiring authority. Deerfield Select Board is the hiring authority, yeah, as a town, town of Deerfield. Um, Are you gonna Are you gonna talk about one uh, North Main Street? I am. Oh, good. That way I don't have to. So uh, still, I don't want to steal his thunder, right? <laughs> we're gonna let We're gonna let Jeff talk about North Main Street. Go ahead, Jeff. Sure. <laughs> so uh, last week they completed the uh, surface paving, surface layer of the uh, paving. Um, and today, myself and the highway superintendent uh, performed, uh, and the police chief performed a walkthrough with MassDOT. And um, we have noticed, and, and people have let us know, that, that some of the structures are not level with the surface of the road. And so we made that clear to MassDOT. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, there aren't great options for for fixing the structures once the final paving has been done um there there's one structure and when i say structure it's uh, typically a, a manhole cover, cover um that, that's fairly significantly below grade um that they are going to have to repair uh you know the the issue is it's in the travel lane some of the other ones are not in the travel lane um and if you don't do anything, the cars are going to drive over it and probably not bust a tire, but are going to start peeling away the pavement. Um, and so, you know, we, we had a conversation with Mastod and said, well, what do, what, do, what do we do? I mean, they we're not the client here. You're the client. Right. They didn't perform uh, a good job. Oh, and somebody is needs to get let in the meeting sorry um and so um we had that conversation mass dot agreed that it was not the way that they had intended it they wanted everything to be level so they're having a conversation with the contractors about how to do that um but at, at this point basically a, a repair is saw cut the pavement lift Let's the structure up, up and then patch it, yeah. um, which again is not ideal, um, especially in a brand new road. But um, that, that that was the the option as opposed to um, milling the entire roadway again yeah, and repaving and it, it. Yeah. Um, which would obviously be a, a, a more expensive and, and take longer to, to fix. Um, they were out today doing loam and seed. Uh, oh, sorry, there was, there was another issue that we talked about, which was uh, when they were loaming and seeding last week, um, the bucket loader hit some of the sidewalk and, and crumpled a couple of the edges. So they're gonna fix that too before the end. So this, I guess I would call this a post paving pre-completion punch list <laughs> walkthrough. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have another one, but um, so they were loaming and seeding today. They were starting to paint lines. Uh, I was out this morning, so I don't, I don't know how far they got with the line painting. I think they were going to do the center line. Yeah, um, it looks like that's down. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but that's, you know, besides loam and seeding, fixing the existing issues, there's a little bit they need to do. Um, around the new curbing at the button ball tree because just to put some gravel in behind the curb and then sort of level it out so that there's not a, a big unofficial catch basin in that area in front of the button ball. Um, we've also heard that because of the new curbing, um, button ball visitors uh, aren't sure where to go now and are parking elsewhere in the tree belt or in certain cases in people's driveways 
So what the town is looking to do is um, buy some temporary signage as a first step to help direct people to where there is public parking meet what two tenths of a mile less than a quarter of a mile um, fr from the tree so that uh, it's not either going on the tree belt and hurting other trees roots or blocking people's driveways um, so we're hoping to do that in, in the short term and hopefully that'll correct people and, and let them know where to park and um, if that doesn't work we'll look at other options more permanent signage and and what else could be done so so to review why the curbing is in front of the button ball tree the what we learned throughout the whole process and started a long time ago is that compacting of soils around the tree damages da damages trees yep the roots so with that understanding that it was decided that the button ball is, is an important part of our community and we wanted to discourage people from parking on the button balls roots so that's why the the berm is in place we do have parking it's by the library and by the uh, right here at 12 school street and also in front of the Blue Heron and formerly the Demos. Oh. Can't hear. I think it's a network error. I, I don't think it's Zoom. I think it's, it's our server. But we will get to the bottom of it. All right, talk to Chris to see if we can fix this up. All right, John? Wouldn't that be through the phone lines, though? Yeah. It's Enter your participants. Area there. You are in the meeting now. There are five participants in the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I think we're back, Crystal. So, so summation, basically, the berm is there to keep people from um, parking on the roots of the tree and compacting the soil. We have parking available we, we are planning on putting up a few signs um, that typically would be like campaign signs that that direct people not to park on the uh, on the uh, in the tree belt and that we have municipal parking available short short distance away and we're going to try to see how and what see if that'll keep the problem down and at the same time if it doesn't I, I you know I, I personally i believe that our police have enough to do without worrying about people parking to see the button ball tree um but it is a quality of life issue for the people who live around it so we'll start try to do the gentle thing and we'll see if it ha i just i just witnessed somebody the other day pu pulled in one driveway came back went by no place to park pulled in another driveway I, I, I get it, I understand it. But maybe if we if we let people know where they can park, that there's parking in the in the area, it it'll get it'll it'll be safer because people aren't being pulling off into the grass right there, right off the road, and, and we'll see what happens. I I I'm ca cautiously optimistic that it will work, but if not, then we'll take the next step and we'll have to go with signage and parking, no parking signs, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's a good place to start. We'll see what happens. Or if there's an entrepreneurial neighbor that wants to sell parking spots for a couple <laughs> bucks, you know, there you go. That's a good it's, it's business yeah. opportunity. That's, that's a good possibility also. But we'll see. And, 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 I, and I, I can understand why the neighbors would be concerned and, and and we're concerned also because that wasn't that wasn't our goal our goal wasn't to drive people you know to into other people's lawn or parking elsewhere it was basically to keep people from parking in the belt the tree belt so we'll see what happens um but that's our plan and we'll see what happens but i i also question about some of the the um they, they looked like they they didn't loam right up to the 
the the pavement they they have a strip of one or you know 12 18 24 inch thing where they they're using um, um, hard pack on the side and I just wondered how come they didn't go grass right up to the side of the rope is that and specifically at the button ball no all, all up and down north I, I, I thought the reason we didn't put the California curbing up both sides of the road was specifically for a reason about keeping the speeds down by having it right. by I, I thought there, there was reasons why you have curbs or not curbs in the link I thought there I thought it was supposed to be grass right up to the side of the road that, that is the plan I know that in some places the road surface was elevated a little from the grassy area so they wanted to add more loam or add some um, additional material before loaming but so I know so it took, when, when, I, when that this, this being the road right yeah. then they have like a band 12 to 18 inches that's hard pack it's not it's not loam and then 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 from that point this way it's seated but there, there's a band about 12 8 inches wide right I, I don't why would you do that well and you know what they did that on 5 and 10 over in Deerfield too in certain spots near the Cumberland Farms and stuff and I was wondering the same thing well what's the could you ask that? him that question yeah because I, I, I would have thought because you're in a residential area yeah I, I don't know why you don't have grass all the way to the road yeah, I mean, we, we walked it, and the only places that they weren't um, putting down the seat, they were hydro seeding, was... Yeah, that, that was just lazy hydro seeders, because they, they hydro seeded hard pack. It will never grow on hard pack. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, and it's, it's just going to be um, scrubby and... Yeah, yeah. and the, the areas that I saw that they didn't do was because they wanted to <laughs> raise the, the grassy area. I, I, I'm just confused. Well, back... back. I'll, I'll look into yeah, but back back to your statement. I I don't I don't quite I don't I don't quite agree with the fact that I, I mean today today's it's not very difficult to uh, set the elevations of manhole covers and and to be out where and and they say that it's out of the travel way for cars. It's in, now it's in the travel way of bicycles. Yeah, or farm equipment or trucks. Well, but if you're it, bigger. I mean, it, it's it, in the travel way of bicycles now, yeah. where which is even worse. Which is even worse. <laughs> they get skinny tires. Yes. So I I don't quite understand how that happens, and. I don't think that I don't think the snowplow will pull it up because it it it, it goes down and it and it and they rolled it into it. And it's probably it's probably not it's not inches it's probably half inch three quarters of an inch, so it's but if you're driving over it, you know there's a bump. Right, and it, the edges around that perimeter are going to last a lot less. Right. Than they would normally if it was done. So, yeah. I, I just don't understand how they how they can do that, and 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 I understand what the option and, and personally. So if they go and fix it, like you said before. If they go and fix it, they'll cut it out, and then five years from now, we'll have it'll be falling apart, and we'll have a maintenance issue. Yeah. And if you don't do anything, we'll have a road that's like a washboard. Every time you come over a manhole, that the way that we've been driving for the last six right. or seven months. I I, I would just want to know who fills out the uh, who fills out the uh, the report on the how the job was done. Cause I don't give it to me because they would be they'd be they'd be scored less than the eighty, and I could put reasons why I scored them less than an eighty. Yeah, I I, I just think that it was all in all, and 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 the final thing is I don't I don't blame the people that put the blacktop down. I blame the people that right, put the, the structures in in place. So yep. you only can work with what you're given. So I, I'm not, and, and it seems like George has been fighting with him from day one, the whole yeah. process. Everything from, I mean, even even like we, we had to pay to put the fence up because they wouldn't put the fence up. Yeah. And, 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 if, and 
if we're going to put us, if we're leaving a job that's not done 100% well, what comes back to the town? Because we put, I mean, we didn't pay for the whole project, but we put a lot of money into it. So what comes back to the town? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, well, you know, in a way we did because we're paying our state taxes and our local taxes. Well, so. I'm not, I'm, yeah, I, and, and, and you're right. You know, but that, that being said, they had, they had MassDOT oversight, mm -hmm. and it should not be that way. I agree. And, and we ended up, we had a certain amount that we had to pay, and we have been paying change orders. Right. Right? That have been coming out of Chapter 90 monies for the most part. Mm -hmm. So if we're not going to get a 100% complete job, what are we getting back? And the extra oversight that we've had to do. And, and not that I want, I, and, and I'm not saying I want the, I don't want the contractor there to do the work. Yeah. Because I don't trust them. Right. We're, I'd rather hire somebody else to do it. But then all the extra oversight that like Jeff's had to do and stuff like that because. And, and to your point, I think that that's been the biggest challenge with this project is we're not the clients and we're not right. paying the contractor. And so even if MassDOT can recover something for poor work, it's, chances are it's, there's no mechanism to give it to the town, right. even though we've invested it. Um, it's been a less than stellar direct, I would say directly. There might be yeah. <laughs> indirectly. I'd find a way to get it back to the town. <laughs> anyway, so, I, so I, I would, I, again, I would say if, if, we haven't, if we haven't paid them yet, Maybe we don't pay them until we have a little, a little meeting. To I said we will not saying that we don't pay them, but right. we hold off until we have a, we have an opportunity to so that they instead of seeing Jeff Kravitz, they can see the the board of three, and we can tell them how we feel about. I'd love for the DOT to mass DOT to sit in that chair. They won't because they know they'll say give me a letter. Put it in a letter. So we will write a letter, and we'll say, and and again, we're not the we're not the final. So we have limited things, but I'd I'd like to put up a sign. I like to put up a sign on Main Street, <laughs> <laughs> expressing my displeasure with Mass DOT and the contractor. Yep, yep, and I think that we knew that this. You know, the, I'm forgetting exactly when we sent that letter. I want to say March, but it could have been later. Yeah, yeah, March, April, April, summer we don't. We think that this con. Yeah, it must have been later because they. Just I feel started. like it was April sometime. Yeah. But, but the the contractor needs constant oversight yeah. and. Um, well, look at all the tree issues. Like you were talking about the fence. I mean, we had, you know yeah. all the back and forth about that. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Anything else? Mm. Yes, uh, a couple things. Go ahead. Um, Before you kick out again, we'll have to. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably ten minutes. Yeah. Um, one is uh, at town meeting um, this spring, we increased the uh, tree warden budget, and that was specifically to do additional uh, tree protection measures mm -hmm. for the elm tree behind the library. And yep. they were out today and installed the uh, lightning rod. Oh, good. Um, so that work was done. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention is weather is getting colder, starting to think about winter time and, and winter road closures and uh, had a conversation with the highway superintendent and police chief about whether we want to place barriers. Um, I, think it, I think it's Reservoir Road uh, on the 63 side. Um, because that's the steep hill to pro there's signage saying this road isn't maintained it's closed in the winter people still go down it or come the other way and try and go up it yeah. and it's fairly steep um, it doesn't get a lot of sunlight so it's often icy and um, I think it, at least once a year we, we get a call that somebody's stuck there and um, so the question was, do we make it impossible for people to go on that, that part of the road? Um, I don't know if we can. If we can 
close off the road. close it off? Like that, yeah. Okay. Can, can you find out if we yeah. can? What road you said it was? Was it reservoir or reservation? I think it's reservation. reservation. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think I said there the you, wrong thing. They, yeah, we mix them up a lot. Okay. Reservation <laughs> crystal. The white line down the cranberry pond, is that what you're talking? Yep. Yep. That's the one. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is just, there's a deadline coming up a week from Friday, um, to close out the initial coronavirus funds that we got from the federal government through the state. Um, and we got, um, I, th I think it was we got about $175,000 is what we actually received. Um, and anything that we haven't spent, we have to give back. Mm -hmm. um, as a way of background, and, and um, if this is too much detail, stop me. But basically, originally FEMA was going to pay for 75% of some expenses and coronavirus was relief fund was going to pay for 25% and then additional things that FEMA wouldn't cover at all. And so when we started out and, and we were buying up masks and gloves and sanitizers, we split all the invoices 75, 25. And then when the new administration came in, they said, oh no, FEMA will cover a hundred percent of that. But there were some things that FEMA, so basically I'm, I've been working everything. with the, the town accountant to make sure that we, everything we ported is tracked correctly and that we're not going to be um, either losing out on money or giving back money that we shouldn't be and so trying to get that all ready and the, the reports due on the 29th so um, if I'm a little bit slower in responding to things that's <laughs> that that's what I'm well. working on is making sure that that um, we have that all set and then after that I'm hoping to re-engage on the American Rescue Plan Act funds and our priorities for that. I'm still trying to get more clarity because I'm still hearing that the reporting is going to be a bear. And if you don't have somebody on staff to confirm that you can spend that money in that way and to report it, the, the best course of action is to limit the number of projects that you do with that money. So um, more details, but fortunately the reporting deadline for that got pushed out until I think April. So that's when the first report. So we have a little bit more time, but that's okay. that's where I'm going to pivot to. Those are my updates. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back up to uh, new business award Riverside Park site improvement plan. Yes. So the Riverside Park project um, was split into two procurements, one for sort of the horizontal landscaping pathways, which is this one, and then the vertical, which is the kayak kiosk and baseball shed, the uh, restroom renovation, and the foundation for a new rec shed. Um, so bo both procurements have gone out to bid. Um, the site improvements, which is the horizontal construction and landscaping, um, was done first. Uh, the low bidder um, was Taylor Davis Landscaping uh, for uh, approximately $44,000. That project includes the sidewalk along the boat ramp and then extending some, um, some of the pathways both to the kayak kiosk to the restroom so that it's fully ADA accessible and then to the dugouts as well. So, um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to award that contract and then hopefully they can get uh, started in, in the fall before the, the ground freezes or they start preparing the site. I guess the other thing to mention about that project is that um, this Friday, we're gonna move the baseball shed um, and that's going to be the temporary storage for baseball and recreation during construction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to get moved away so that the new kayak kiosk can, can be built in that area. Okay. Hmm. okay. So you have a, a recommendation on the award? Yes. I recommend that the um, 
the, the select board award the contract for Riverside Park site improvements to the low bidder Taylor Davis landscaping. Uh, motion. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. At this <clears throat> time, we have a motion made and seconded to approve Taylor Davis uh, award to Taylor Davis Davis for the Riverside Park site improvement. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We have three zero on that, Jeff. When when you expect the rest of the, uh, are are you looking waiting to the spring for the rest of it, or we're hoping to start this fall. Um, we had to delay the building, the vertical construction procurement because we were hearing from uh, contractors that their subcontractors need a little bit more time to get um, their numbers in. Um, so that those bids are going to be due the uh, week from Thursday. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm holding out hope that it's going to be a, a mild fall and that we'll at least be able to do some site prep in the fall and then hit the ground running in the spring. Okay. Okay, anything else? David? No. Crystal? Mm -hmm. All right, is there any comments from the, uh, anybody on? Okay, without any hearing more comments, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion. And, and motion made and seconded. All those in favor of uh, adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 It's uh, adjourned at 8.04. We'll see you next week.